All right. Um, so last week we talked about solutions. Uh, solution is a mixture. It's when you mix things together and they're evenly distributed. The distribution of particles is perfect. And I'm going to put the word perfect in quotes, as you can see on the video. Um, so if you took samples from that solution, every single sample would be identical. It wouldn't, doesn't matter where you took it from. There are a bunch of terms in the notes. The worksheets do not practice those terms very often. You have to look through the terms. I will be using the terms from time to time, but it's not going to say, what does supersaturated mean? You need to look those things up and know them. So the first question, though, is really just about the, the two terms. This is the only two term questions on there, solute and solvent. Um, the solute is whatever you have in the lesser amount. In this case, it's the ammonium nitrate. The solvent is in the larger amount, limestone. We don't have a lot of large, we don't have a lot of solid, solid mixtures, but this is a solid, solid mixture, um, which is kind of weird. We don't usually see a lot of these. The second question was about percentages, and we had an equation in the notes that was you take the, the one, oh, that's way too big. You take the, the, the solute, still way too big, come on. The solute, divided by the solution times 100 is equal to whatever percentage. I guess technically it doesn't have to be the solute divided by the solution. It's whatever part you care about divided by the, the total. Um, so in this case though, they gave us the percentage. They said it's 11.8. Why is this 0.118 here though, if they gave us 11.8? They already divided the 100 over. So they just divided the 100 over. So 11.8 divided by 100 is 0.118. That's why your like, middle school teacher said, just move the decimal two places, bam. Um, the percentages are really over 100. Uh, you could even think of this as a ratio. 11.8 over 100 is equal to X over 1,500 grams because percentages are always over 100. That's why it's percent per 100. Um, so just solve for the mass of the alcohol or ethyl alcohol that's in the wine. Uh, this is without sig figs. That one is with sig figs. So we don't use this a lot, although in the real world of non-chemistry land that most people live in, this is very common. So I picked up this dial soap uh, earlier today, turned it around, and it has triclosan in it. Don't ask me what triclosan is other than it's in this dial soap. And it says, there's 0.15% triclosan in there. They're not doing it by moles. They're doing it by mass also. So when they mix the components together and they advertise them to people, they do it by mass. And triclosan evidently is an antibacterial thing. It kills bacteria. So We, however, are chemists in this classroom, so we're going to use moles a whole lot. And we talked about molarity last class is the way that chemists measure moles in a solution. And molarity is how many moles have to been dissolved into a volume and the volume must be in liters. All right, the volume has to be in liters. And we use this equation, M is equal to N over V, to kind of help us do the math. Um, we started using N as the moles last chapter. Uh, number three, though, does it give us moles in the question, though? Does the question give us moles? No. How would you handle that if it doesn't give you moles, but it gives you grams? Periodic table, yeah. So here we go. We have the 14.32 grams of this manganese sulfate. Uh, this is the molar mass of manganese sulfate here. Oops, left out the S. <coughs> So this is the molar mass of manganese sulfate. So that's how many moles they put into there. This is the number of moles, 0 0.09484. And then we divided it by the volume, but the volume has to be in liters. So we took the 645 milliliters and divided it by 1,000 to get 0.645 liters. And we have this answer that is 0.147 molar MnSO4. 
And what's confusing about these numbers is they don't mean much to people who don't know anything about molarity. Like you look at that, Frank, and do you have any idea how concentrated or dilute that is? I don't either, because I don't have a lot of experience with manganese sulfate. But if it was like hydrochloric acid or even a sodium chloride solution, compounds I work with a lot, when I see molarities, I have some concept of how much is in there, because I have experience with it. Um, but there's always a max. What is the term for the maximum amount the water could hold or a solution could hold? When you reach the max and it starts piling up, was it? Saturated, yeah, saturated. That's the max. You can't exceed the max without messing with the temperature. We're going to get to saturation graphs and stuff in a minute. Um, the second one is kind of the same idea as number three, but it's in reverse. Uh, you have a solution. It has a molarity that's given. How many grams are hiding inside of it, really? This is, this is how many grams are floating around inside of it that are potassium sulfide. So we can use the equation. We know the molarity. We know the volume. Convert that to liters. And so I could do molarity times volume will give me the moles. So I did the molarity times the volume. And I have the moles. And then I used the periodic table to convert it into grams of potassium sulfide. <clears throat> so three and four kind of represent the big two ideas in the terms of the math in this chapter. They could be mixed with things we've already done in the past, like stoichiometry, um, not really so much gas laws. Why not gas laws? Why can't you really do this with gas laws? What are we talking about here? Solutions. And, and so this is a solution. Solutions are usually in, you know, dissolved in liquid states and therefore gas laws shouldn't really apply. You could figure out what the molarity of oxygen is in the air, but very few people do that. You could figure out how many moles of oxygen are in the air, what volume is the classroom. You could, you could do that, but I've never seen that done ever. Um, but technically, air is a solution. Is it evenly distributed? Is the oxygen everywhere? Or is it just on this side of the room with these people? Uh, as evidenced by the fact that you haven't passed out yet, the oxygen is everywhere, right? And so if I take a sample from all over the room, it should be evenly distributed. And that means it's a solution. It's a gas-gas solution. Um, all right. Number five, they want to know how much chlorine is in this solution. Uh, but this compound doesn't have only one chlorine in it. This compound has three chlorines. And so if you took a solid and you added it to water, what state of matter would these things be now that they're in water? Aqueous. Yeah, they'd be aqueous. Um, they would be dissolved into the water. So they'd be aqueous. And for every one of these compounds that dissolves, you get one manganese. But for every one of these compounds that dissolves, you get three times as much chlorine. Because the chlorines aren't going to stay together. They're going to break apart and fly all over the place in the water, or float, I guess. They're going to float all over the place in the water and spread out. They're going to spread out because they're all negatively charged. So they would not be attracted to each other. So they would really spread out to their maximum distance apart within the solution. So how does that apply to this question? We have a volume and we have a molarity, but the molarity is for the whole compound. The molarity is for the whole compound. And when this compound dissolves, you really get triple the quantity of chlorine. So first, let's figure out how many moles of the compound there is. So I did the volume times molarity gives me moles. So molarity times volume. There's the moles of potassium chloride. Sorry, potassium. That's manganese. So that's the moles of the whole compound. This is how many moles, 0 0.78, that were put into the water. And then when they dissolve, they break apart. And so you really have three times the number of moles of chlorine in the water or solution than manganese. So that's kind of like blending um, 
this molarity and volume stuff with stoichiometry, with a mole to mole ratio. All right, pause for questions. Any questions? My, my students just rescued me. I almost talked for the next 15 minutes without actually recording anything. That would have been classic Murphy. Um, and they know it, too. That's the giggle. Yeah. Yeah, Billy just giggled. Um, so we've, we've got this idea about uh, molarity is moles over volume. And hey, rearrange it. Molarity times volume equals moles. And so when I pick up a, a solution, let's say this water bottle here of mysterious water um, that has stuff floating around in it, if I double the volume of pure water, not what this is, this is, is this pure water or is this from like a sink or something like that? You got it from the fridge. So it's got like the big stuff filtered out probably, but not like the tiny little salt ions that are like ridiculously small. So your filter can only grab like the bacteria and the large dirt particles, but they're, it's never going to get the tiny little ions because they're tiny. All right, so there's still ions in this water that she's drinking, and that's fine. You, you need to have slightly ionized water. You need some ions in your water, otherwise you'll deplete your cells. But if we take pure water and double the volume of the solution, what happens to the amount of ions? Does it change in there? No, it doesn't change. It just gets spread out, and that's what molarity is about. Molarity is about how close together are the particles, how far apart are the particles. If the molarity is high, then the particles are really close together. And if the molarity is low, then they're really far apart. And so the moles aren't changing, just how far apart the moles are. And so here was the molarity of a sodium hydroxide solution, 10.75. That is a molarity that frightens me. If I make that solution, it frightens me. Um, that would be a pH of 15, 15.1, something like that. That is right off the scale, isn't it? The scale is supposed to be 0 to 14, and that's off the scale. So if I have a solution that's 10 molar sodium hydroxide, I'm quaking, all right? So they've diluted it down. They've diluted it down drastically to 0.25. 10, 0.25. Let me actually grab a calculator and do some math. I may have just done some math wrong in my head. Natural log of 10.75. I mean negative log 15. Okay. So yeah, this is going from a pH of about 15 to a pH of around 13. That's drastically better, isn't it? At least it's on the scale now. Um, what did they do? They took a small amount of that really concentrated stuff and they diluted it down drastically. So here's what they wanted. This is the molarity they wanted and the volume that they wanted. This is the molarity they started with. And the question is, what volume of the frightening stuff are you going to take out and dilute down? And the way that's done is you have something like this. It's a, a volumetric pipette. Not that you can see this on the video. It looks it's really exotic equipment like from France or something. Um, and you stick this down in the solution. You draw up however much you need and then take it over and release it into the new flask and water it down. And they're adding a ton of water here. They're going from 0 0.046 milliliters that they drew out to, to sorry, 0 0.046 liters to two liters. So that's a huge difference, isn't it? You get two liters minus 0 0.046, it's almost equal to two liters, isn't it? Yes. Should it be 0 0.047? Let's, let's check the math there. See whether or not that girl wins an extra point. If you wanted to do the math correctly, like she does, then you would change this to a 7. Yeah. So there you go. Um, that's the tiny volume. 
And the difference between these two volumes, if you do, uh, in this case, you subtract the two volumes, you would know the approximate volume of water that they're adding to dilute it down. It's not the actual volume of water, it's the approximate volume of water. <coughs> That's good, I just coughed into the microphone. Uh, all right, number seven. We have a mass, it's dissolved into water. What's the molarity? This was done using dimensional analysis. Could you use the formula? It would give you the same answer. As long as you don't round along the way, you always round at the very last step uh, since it's all multiplying and dividing. The only issue I have with this answer is that it doesn't say CuSO4. All right, it should say copper sulfate. Um, number eight was the last, I think, of the molarity questions. We had 5.15 grams of iodine, which I, does it say I2 in the purple packet? Yeah, good. It did not last year. And iodine is one of those diatomics, right? It's Hoff Brinkle, Brinkle Hoff. I bring those wrong. One of those, yeah. Um, so I changed that mass into moles again, divided by the volume. We have the molarity of I2 in there. Um, this is the first time, though. What is the solvent in number eight? What is the solvent in number eight? This hasn't been the solvent yet. It's not water. What is it? It's an alcohol. Right, the iodine is being dissolved into an alcohol. And we talked about something in the notes called IPAN. I stood for what? Ionic. P stood for polar. A stood for a stood for uh, alcohol. <laughs> what did N stand for? Nonpolar. Evidently, my tongue became very polar and stuck to the roof of my mouth. Um, iodine. Where would it fit in that land? I two. Is it ionic? Is it a metal and a nonmetal? No, it's not ionic. Is it polar? You have uh, an I with seven valence electrons and an I with seven valence electrons and then they single bond to each other. Is that polar? Well, the two sides are perfectly equal, so that is nonpolar, right? That's nonpolar and this is an alcohol. So nonpolar molecules and alcohols will mix to a certain degree. Um, I, I think I I talked about IPAN in, in some classes like it was a fact and it was strong and fast, but the reality is is that you're in high school chemistry and some of what we tell you is a little bit hinky um, because there's so many exceptions. IPAN works for the general world. We say ionics will dissolve in polar substances. Do you think there are some ionic compounds though that won't dissolve in polar substances? The answer to that is yes. But for our purposes, ionics and polars, they mix pretty well. Polars and alcohols, they mix well. Uh, alcohols and nonpolars, they mix well. Nonpolar also mixes with nonpolar because they're very similar. Um, but does nonpolar and ionic mix? Not at all. And if you think about what these mean, ionics, Ionics have positive cations and negative ions, so they're drastically different on each side. Polar is imbalanced, like it's like water is our most classic polar molecule. And it ends up having, because it's so imbalanced, it ends up having positive sides and negative sides, so these guys are attracted to each other. Alcohols, I think I could, no, I'm not going to get to a drawing on alcohol later. Like here's the most common alcohol, ethanol. It's the most common alcohol people use for dissolving things. Methanol is also very common. But uh, ethanol, if you look at the left side of the molecule, the left side kind of looks nonpolar. But the right side looks polar. And that's why it fits between the two. That's why it kind of bridges the gap. That's why it'll do both sides, because it's a little bit of both. And that's why water kind of goes on both sides. 
Water's got the positive negative aspect of the ionic, but then it's got this polar stuff that's kind of attracted to that polar stuff of the alcohol. So they'll mix together because they're similar. But ionics are compart compartly, no, that's not a word, completely balanced, so they have no attraction to the ionic that are completely imbalanced. Kind of like people. Um, all right. That didn't help. That's much better. So uh, we had this graph. This graph is a very common graph. Um, does this have every ionic compound on the planet on it? Absolutely not. It's a very small sample, right? It's come a, a couple of common compounds. Um, you can see the lines of each, and they're pretty easy to read. You, you re okay, so we're at 30 degrees Celsius. 10 grams will dissolve in 100 grams. If the temperature is increased to 80 degrees Celsius, at 80 degrees Celsius, how much potassium chlorate? Where is potassium chlorate on here? That's it right there. Climb up, hit the line, cruise across. Should be 40. It's, right? It's not terribly difficult to read these graphs. So a couple other examples. Um, and then what do these lines represent? These lines represent a saturated solution. What if, what if we were at 80 degrees Celsius and you only put 30 grams of potassium chlorate in there? Would it be saturated at 80 degrees Celsius and 30 grams? If, what do you call that then? unsaturated, right? If you're below the line for that compound, you are unsaturated. What if you took this 40 grams and you cooled it? So you have 40 grams, but you cooled it down to 75 degrees Celsius, but it all stayed dissolved. It, if you cooled it down to 75, you're above the line right now, aren't you? Sat super saturated means above, that's not the word super. Yeah, right, if you were above the line, you would be super saturated. Um, and the last thing that's not done with this, what if you doubled the amount of water? How would those answers change? Say that I gave you 200 grams of water, how would this mass change? This is based off of 100 grams of water. It would double, right. You have double the volume of water, so you could put in double the volume of mass of whatever the ionic compound is. Yeah. Uh, 12 is just a dilution one. We've already done a couple dilution ones, but here's another one. I'm too zoomed in. I always like when I breathe really heavy into the microphone and you get to listen to it later. It's like, <sighs> in the microphone, that's really pleasant. Sorry about that. Um, again, I, I looked at those two numbers, that 18 molar sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid's one of the big five dangerous acids that people usually keep. It's one of the really, really strong acids. Um, we have 18 molar. It's very frightening to work with. It instantaneously burns you. 0.1 molar, 0.1 molar is, you know, a lot less. It's 100 times less. It's more than 100 times less. You'd have to divide this twice by 10 to get close to that number. So it's more than 100 times less. Um, it has a pH of 13 versus a pH of like negative one, negative two, something like that. Um, that's neither here nor there. Though we have this molarity equation. Uh, the volume we solved for comes out in liters. This is probably not the right use of liters, right? How many miles did it take you to walk here from your locker? Would you measure that distance in miles from locker to here? No, what would you probably measure it in? Meters? I, I love that answer. Was that you, Patrick? Oh, yards. Okay. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> yards would work because it makes more sense to measure distances of walking 
in like feet or yards? Would you measure it in inches? Probably not, unless it was like, I walked 12 inches, right? Um, I took one step. So we usually adjust the units to fit the moment. So this number is way too small. It's 0 0.00138 liters, 0 0.00138 liters. Um, how many liters, how many milliliters are in a liter? A thousand, right? So there's 1,000 milliliters in there. So I multiplied by a thousand to get to that answer. And remember this guy here, for those of you watching the video, I'm holding up a volumetric, a uh, 1,000 milliliter graduated cylinder. 1,000 milliliter graduated cylinder. How many liters are in here? One. All right, someone asks, who's your leader? You just hold this up. Um, how many milliliters are following this liter? There's thousands of milliliters following every liter, right? So multiply the liters by mil a thousand, you have the milliliters. There we go. Okay, I left these blank because I thought we would work them out. Um, carbon tetrachloride, what's the formula for carbon tetrachloride? CCL4, right? So we draw a Lewis dot structure. Yeah, you still need to know how to do that. Carbon has four valence electrons. Chlorine, how many does chlorine have? And how do you even figure that out? Go to the periodic table. It's right there. Go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Is that true? What's that? It is a huge syringe, yeah. No comment on that. Um, so I'm going to put my seven valence electrons around this chlorine and the one that's by itself I'm putting close to the carbon for easy bond purposes. But there's four chlorines. Each one has seven. And we are trying to get them to what magic number? What's the magic number? Eight. Eight. The octet rule from way back when said we want to get them to eight. So these seven cl uh, chlorine, we need one more, and it bonds to the one on the carbon, and bonds to the one on the carbon, bonds to the one on the carbon, bonds to the one on the carbon, and the chlorines are at eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then the carbon, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Everyone's gotten eight. We've drawn the Lewis dot structure um, using lines, but it still works. Uh, this, I don't know if you remember the shape names. This would be tetra tetrahedral, right? That's, so let's say tetrahedral. Would you say this is polar or nonpolar? Nonpolar. Nonpolar meant that the molecule is balanced in every direction and you have chlorines pulling against chlorine uh, with the carbon in the middle. Chlorine pulling against chlorine with the carbon in the middle and it's balanced in every direction so it's nonpolar. All right. So I drew that one. Ammonia, does it say the formula is NH3 there? Did it give you the formula or just say ammonia? Sorry. So ammonia is NH3. Uh, that's nitrogen has five valence electrons. Hydrogen has one. Hydrogen has one. Hydrogen has one. Um, hydrogen is one of those exceptions we talked about. It only really needs to get to two. So is that one balanced or imbalanced after drawing the Lewis dot structure and getting everything to eight? So that one, it's good with the hydrogens left and right, but top and bottom, it's polar, isn't it? And then lastly, water, H2O. Polar or nonpolar? Very polar. So. Will it dissolve? Will carbon tetrachloride dissolve in water? This is nonpolar, that's polar. Will they dissolve? No. Ammonia is polar. Water is polar. Yes, it will dissolve. Oh, sorry. Insoluble. I'm going to answer the question, not make up my own answers. And this one would be soluble. Yes, that would be soluble. No, that would be insoluble. Um, we're not going to do the slightly soluble. It's either going to be yes or no, soluble or insoluble. Uh, predict the following in hexane. Hexane, you don't know what hexane is, do you? 
Um, hexane looks like this, though. I'll draw it. It's a carbon. It's actually six carbons, which is why it's hex. Hex means six. And then each of these carbons is bonded in a circle and then has two hydrogens coming off of it. And that's about as much as I'm going to draw, like that. Each of those two lines has a hydrogen on the end. And imagine the circle with all these hydrogens. That's a big nonpolar molecule because every direction ends up being the same. Um, is water going to dissolve in hexane? Yeah, it says this is nonpolar, water's polar, so it should be insoluble. Oil. What do you think? What can you tell me about oil and water? Do they mix? No. So you know water's polar. What does oil have to be if it doesn't dissolve in water? Has to be nonpolar. So by deductive reasoning, you know that oil is nonpolar. Should it dissolve in hexane then? That's probably soluble in hexane. Um, and again, we're, we're saying, yeah, it's probably soluble. They're both nonpolar. I'm not saying for a fact they are. There are some oils that would dissolve well in hexane and some that wouldn't. Um, actually, I drew cyclohexane. It's not actually hexane. I just realized that. Oh, skip the last one. And the last one's, again, just a mass percent question. What's the mass percent of each component? Um, it has to be the mass of the thing you're looking at divided by the total mass. So uh, put together the total mass by adding up the three components and then took like 5.31 over 154.34. So that's how I got the percentage for copper. And then for zinc, you just change it out for zinc. And then for iron, you change it out for iron. Um, th those should add up to close to 100%. Sometimes the sig figs ruin the math. All right? Questions from the peanut gallery? Would you like me to stand right in front? I guess I could pause this now. Any questions? So what? It is still recording. That's, that's not awkward. I haven't hit.